Welcome, Richard. It's a pleasure to chat with you. And I'm fascinated to hear what you have to say about your new book, which is entitled Three Minutes a Day. And the book claims that by following these practices for only three minutes a day, uh, for 14 weeks, you can transform your meditative practice and your life. Could you explain a little bit about the book and how it does that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think to really understand what this book is about, it's worth having a brief review of what meditation is about, because, you know, it's my belief that meditation should be taught in primary school, <laughs> along with reading, writing, it should be reading, writing and meditation. And of course, most people have never, ever meditated and really think it's some mystical practice from the East and all this sort of stuff. It's this, the only thing we will ever experience and can ever experience are the inputs from our five senses and our thoughts and imaginations. There is nothing else we can experience. The end. Everything else is inferential. We can infer from our five senses, thoughts, and imaginations and external world. We can infer from our thoughts and imaginations and our five senses an internal world. But they're all inferences built upon the primary events of our experience, which are the inputs of our five senses, our thoughts and imaginations. Meditation is about directly addressing those inputs, i.e. looking at experience as experience, not using the five senses, thoughts and imaginations to make a world outside, inside, wherever we think the world is. And unfortunately, and in modernity, this is particularly true, in contemporary culture, which we learn about through scientific techniques, which is somehow real. And we're just observers. We're almost non-entities in terms of this external world. This is absolute nonsense. I mean, it's completely crazy because we are the only knower that we can ever know there is no other way of knowing anything so meditation is about this fundamental fact of life and i say it's so fundamental that we miss it it's like looking through a window and not seeing the glass we just don't see that the world we live in is actually a construct an inference made from these five senses thoughts and imaginations now the truth is we all suffer from reflexive reactivity. And this is the next bit of why meditation is important. Reflexive reactivity is our capacity to react to events quickly. Unfortunately, because it's reflexive, it tends to be unconsciously. So we're always reacting to events. What we're actually doing in our cognitive uh, process is we're constructing a map of the world. And that map is what we make, we infer from our five senses, thoughts, and imaginations. And that map is full of reflexive triggers. Now we need them because the map is essentially protective. You could well say that what took a naked ape from the savannas of Africa to driving around in sports cars and you know causing global warming is precisely this mapping. This mapping enables us to learn from experience because when a bad thing happens, we remember it. And when it next occurs in our five senses, thoughts and imaginations, we know what to do. And so this map is reflexive. Unfortunately, it's also paranoid. It's really only interested in bad news. That's why the newspapers are full of bad news. You can't, if you put a newspaper a headline that says something went well, Nobody cares. You say something went badly. Everybody wants to read about it. That's because the map maker is protective. And so we are in a protective mechanism made by our remarkable cognitive apparatus that is reflexively mapping the world. Now, this, of course, is in our common language. We use this word recognition. We say, I recognize you or I recognize this. And what we mean when we say that is our map has got a reference for it. We know what it is. Normally, this is associated with naming. 
So Lily always would say, I recognize that. I have a name for it. Again, when we walk around in our normal experience, everything's got a name. That means we're walking in a memory. We're actually recognizing, recognizing, cognizing again all the time. Actually, it's about 20 times a second we are recognizing. That's about the speed this thing goes. Now, the problem is, if our map making was totally accurate, that's to say it didn't have any colorants in it, it was absolutely the case that what we were mapping was what was out there. There'd be no issue. The problem is, because our map comes from our memories, that means it's everything ever happened to us, the circumstances of our birth, the country we're born in, all the influences we get from the news, etc., all put into this map. So our experience is being conditioned. We are literally being colored by the map. And consequently, we land up in a world which is not the case. We are mapping a world significantly inaccurately. And this is a cause of enormous problems. It's a cause of problems for us. And it's a cause of problems for everyone we meet because they are also mapping the world in exactly the same way. So two people meet, they have different maps, so they disagree. Or you get national maps where communities of people in a so-called country have a map together. And then another country has a different map and they fight like we see now. These are tremendously problematic consequences of a lack of understanding of our cognitive process. And the final element of this is what's happening in modernity. In modernity, we have increasingly sophisticated devices that capture our attention. Strictly speaking, this is to say they advert our attention, which is where the word advertising comes from. Now, of course, with the advent of mobile phones, people are carrying around remarkably sophisticated little computers that are designed to capture their attention. As a result, our attention is being taken this way and that way and up and down and in and out. And as a result, we are stressed. We feel disempowered. We feel disconnected from our experience. And this is getting worse and worse and worse. So we have an, an absolute epidemic of alienation, emotional stress, people feeling disempowered. It's really problematic. All of these issues are addressed by meditation because meditation is the fundamental life skill of seeing cognition prior to recognition. It is literally that. How can you get to cognition prior to recognition? If you can break the automatic, reflexive, recognitive loop that we're, in which we are caught, if you can break that by seeing cognition prior to recognition, an entirely different experience emerges just from that very simple thing. Now, once this background is understood, meditation is properly seen as a skill. It's not religious per se. There are skillful means which come about when you know how to meditate, i.e. you can pray, you can visualize, you can do all kinds of things in your meditation. You can use your meditation skillfully. And people conflate the basic mechanism of meditation with those skillful means. And then they say, oh, meditation is religious or whatever, or it's Buddhist, or they have these labels for it. Actually, it isn't. It's totally neutral. Meditation is merely the faculty of seeing cognition itself. And we have that capacity. So the question is, how? Now, we are being reflexively roiled up continuously by our map making. And remember, this map making doesn't just have names in it. It has, I want that. I don't want that. This is good. This is bad. Oh, this is something I should worry about. This is something I should go for. All of these injunctions are in that map. So we're being pulled this way and that, pulled this way and that. And as a result, we can't see clearly. So the first step in any meditation practice, literally any, is to simplify down the five senses, thoughts and imaginations 
to one of those six ways we experience. They're often called the six gates. One of the gates. So you simplify down to one. There's been in modernity this great growth in what's called mindfulness. Well, actually, mindfulness is just calmness meditation. I wish it wasn't called mindfulness meditation. It is very confusing. Actually, it's about simplifying down to the touch at the tip of the nose, one of the gates, and then watching it. And if you do that, you can become calm. But there is a really important key in developing calmness. And so what happens, we're all taught to concentrate, and concentration is normally thought to be taking your attention and adverting it to a chosen object. The problem is that kind of concentration is brittle. So you hold your concentration on an object, then a sound happens or a thought happens or something happens, and you're immediately adverting to whatever it is that, that, that has disturbed you. you. You're always trying to hold on to this brittle, concentrative focus. But the old meditation masters actually understood there were two phases to concentration. And this is a total key to being able to hold concentration. Concentration is not merely to advert attention. It is also to savor the object of attention. Now, this second phase, this savoring, is an extremely important element of concentration. The metaphor is simple enough. You lift a cup of coffee to your lips. That's vitaka, it's called, adverting your concentration. You then savor the coffee. That's called vikara, savoring. So having adverted, which is what in three minutes a day one does for the first week, the next step is to follow a changing object. And actually what I take is a bell. And so you strike a bell, that's vitaka. And as the bell fades, that's vikara. Now, following a fading sensory input, this case with the ear gate, following it into silence is to learn to be concentrated with no object of concentration at all because the object fades. Now, the interesting thing about vikara, this savoring concentration, is it's not brittle. Actually, when something comes to, quote, disturb vikara, it just gets incorporated into vikara as a flavor of the vikara. And as a result, one can move toward calmness. Now, calmness is not having no thoughts. This is another huge misconception that comes about from a misunderstanding of what meditation is about. Our cognitive apparatus is designed to think. It's designed to run scenarios. It's always mapping. It's always making what ifs for us. That's its job. The idea one is going to stop thinking is nonsensical. You might as well say, stop breathing. It is a natural function. The key is to become non-reactive. That's to say we're not always being pulled this way and that by whatever our sense inputs are saying to us, which means we gradually calm down to the point where we achieve clear seeing. Now, clear seeing, the clarity of mind that comes from calmness is called vipassana. Pasana literally means seeing, and V means discriminating or clear. Vipassana is a fruit of calmness. It's not a meditation on its own. It is a fruit of meditation. If you are able to become calm, you will see clearly. And the metaphor is like you have a glass of water with a bit of dust in it, and it's all being stirred up and broiled around. You can't see it. Put it on a shelf, become non-reactive, leave it on its own, and the water clears. And suddenly you see clearly. Now, seeing clearly brings a many, many benefits. It's normally associated with this strange word wisdom, because someone who sees clearly is non-reactive to what is in front of them. And then they go, I wonder what that is. They have the freedom to then make inquiry without being automatically reactive. And often when you look that second time, you find there are alternatives which you missed 
in your reactivity. So in our normal life, we are literally bombarded by injunctive stuff coming from our own recognitive map. And that injunctive stuff is pulling us this way and that. It makes us easily manipulated because unfortunately, recognition is entirely mechanical. That's to say, if I can put into you an idea, you will recognize it, which is exactly how advertising works. Advertising is designed to do precisely that. You put something into someone's mind, they recognize it and think it's real. Same with propaganda, politics. You can see all of this going on the whole time. And now we have chat GBT and all of the AIs. It's going to get even worse. And so all of these problems are addressed by this fundamental life skill. Now, meditation was designed initially for monks. And unsurprisingly, most meditation practices last for a long time because monks wrote them. Monks were quite happily able to sit for an hour or two hours. I mean, that's their day job. That's what they do. That's what monks are about. It isn't necessary to sit that long to get this insight. The insight that separates cognition from recognition can be achieved in much shorter periods. Now, the problem is, in describing this, I'm talking about an internal state. If I was to say, here is my ring, I can point to my ring and you can say, oh, yeah, that's a ring. I've got one of those. I know what that is. If I talk about calmness, I can't point to calmness. So how am I ever going to explain what calmness is? Now, this is exactly like if I was to say to you, I want to talk, tell you about chocolate. And I would say, well, it's, a, it's brown, it's a bit sweet, it's a bit oily, it melts in your mouth, you know, all this kind of stuff. I could write you a dictionary on chocolate, but you'd have no idea what chocolate was. If I gave you a piece of chocolate like that, I know what chocolate is. So the deal in writing this book is really simple. I explain what it is that I'm trying to point out to you then there's a really simple exercise that you do for three minutes a day. And as long as you do it for three minutes a day for seven days, you are going to know what I pointed out to you because you'll have that experience. Then there's another exercise. OK, got that. Now let's do this. So indeed, the first two chapters are saying this is adverting concentration and we look at a candle. Then the next week is this is savoring concentration and we look at the sound of a fading bell. There's a good example. The book is designed to give reference for these key terms. And over the 14 weeks, there are a series of exercises. They build up to the point where anybody who does this three minutes a day for 14 weeks will know what meditation is. They will have the taste of chocolate. Now, they can either just use that in their daily life because it is extremely useful or they can go further then. They can develop in skillful means, whatever they like, but they have got the taste of meditation. What I think is tragic is when religiously inclined people try to develop the skillful means that come from meditation without the meditation. Then they're merely grasping at what they think they might achieve. And of course, we have these big words like enlightenment and liberation and all this big language, as if somehow we can get that. But if we don't have this fundamental capacity, all of these things are just words. So it's really the preface for a life lived more fully, whether you're religiously inclined or indeed perhaps you're a business person who just wants to be able to take time out during a busy day and see things a different way. Or maybe you're an artist who wants to become more creative. It really, or maybe you're a housewife, you know, with your kids bugging you the whole time. You just want to be able to take time out. And this time out is not relaxation in the way that people normally think of it. You know, just lie down, you know, do nothing. This is a very precise not doing because it's learning to not react. And the surprising thing is when you don't react, you become clear. You don't disappear at all. 
people often think, oh, if I become non-reactive, I'm going to disappear. Quite the reverse. When you become non-reactive, you appear. You actually find that you, for once, are in the center of your being. You're no longer being pulled this way and that. It is quite literally as if the emperor has taken the throne and the vizier, this advisor that's been telling us what to do, is sitting in the proper place. You find you have your capacity, your humanity, your human potential back just from this extremely simple insight. And it is so simple that I really mean it when I say three minutes a day is all it takes. And actually, I made an app and gave it away with the book. There's a free app with the book. So people can put it on their phones. And really, it's not something you do in front of a, a shrine. It doesn't have to be done in a special room. It can be done anywhere because our recognitive map is being triggered everywhere. So as a result, meditation is literally the most portable life skill you can imagine. All you need is your cognition and you can meditate. So to me, this is where meditation begins and ends. And having established vipassana, having established the ability to see clearly, your life choices go from a career, which is quite literally the little slot your recognitive map has allowed you to do, which is a function of your background, your education, the things that happened to you, et cetera, et cetera, to, oh, what will I do with my life? And that freedom, that liberation, is a liberation from our own cognition. We're not being locked up by anyone else. It's our own cognition. So again, meditation opens the door to freedom in a very fundamental way. And so that's why I feel so strongly about it. And I, you know, Dharma College, where I teach, I'm dean there, was dedicated to trying to present the Asian wisdom traditions, which are really remarkable in terms of their continuity and their cultural importance, Re present them without the Pali and the Sanskrit and the Tibetan and all the technical stuff in completely contemporary language so that we could address modernity, we could address contemporary conditions. Rather than requiring people to learn all this complicated stuff, we say, okay, we'll come to you with the language that you are using. That's the whole idea. And so in beginning to develop courses for Dharma College, one of the things that came up was meditation. I began to teach meditation. I realized it could really be done in these very short little snippets. And that's what was then transcribed. And I gave courses over many times. They were transcribed, put it together. And that's the book. So that's how the book came about. So forgive Rob, long introduction, but that's it. Wow. Well, that's very impressive and very, uh, very uh, clear. Uh, and of course, there are many different uh, angles we could take on what you just said. Uh, let's just just uh, start with Vikara, uh, which is this savoring that you mentioned. Let us say that you are doing uh, this particular practice, listening and to and savoring the sound of a bell. Let's say you live in an extremely noisy street. And there are all sorts of truck sounds and kids screaming and stereos and whatnot. So if I understand your point, when you're doing this particular type of meditation, you're also savoring those peripheral noises as part of experience. Is that more or less correct? That would be an expert level. So let's just take Vikara. So all beginning meditators have to simplify the six gates to one because we're being so pulled around that we have to quieten it all down and get to one. So any beginning practice says, please try to quieten stuff down. Just because you're a beginner, <laughs> that's the only reason. And so, of course, the beginning meditator wants to be in a quiet place and just concentrate on one gate. But once you become used to savoring, then you find you can open your eyes you can open your ears and you can savor the entirety of the display. But that's a much more expert level. That's what you're working towards. And this leads to an extremely interesting point 
about a term that you must have heard called sense restraint. Now, sense restraint is mistranslated as closing down the senses so you hear nothing and see nothing, etc. This is a total misunderstanding of sense restraint. Sense restraint is to restrain the reaction, what in technically is called the nimitta, to restrain the nimitta that arises from sense input, i.e. you become non-reflexive. That's exactly what sense restraint is. So what we're learning as a life skill is to give ourselves some space. So when there are car doors going and kids screaming and all the rest of it, we're not being pulled around by the map going, what's this, what's this, what's this, what's this? As if we have to react to everything that happens. And as I say, the level of emotional stress because of rapid social change, rapid environmental change, and rapid technological change is going up and up and up because we cannot react to all the inputs that we are receiving. We have to learn how to savor them. And once we do that, suddenly everything simplifies. And interestingly, the advisor who before was a prisoner forcing us into reacting to everything then becomes a friend. And the advisor may say, I think it's one of those. And you go, yeah, maybe it is, but let's have a look. You know, you suddenly get the ability to respond rather than react. And that distinction is extremely important. A response is a considered reaction. A reaction is merely reflexive. And unfortunately, because all of our reactions come from the past, we go round and round and round in circles, repeating the same mistakes because that's the reactions we're getting. So this is where we get the appalling circularity that we have both in our own lives and also in human history. Human history goes round and round in circles. What do they say? Uh, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And the reason it rhymes is because it's guided by the past. And so you can read the meditations of Marcus Aurelius or someone written in 150 AD. You could have met him yesterday. What he's saying about humanity is exactly what we're experiencing. And that's because there's been a complete failure to address our reactivity. And this is what the this is the gift the Asian traditions have. And you know, I want to say something. I, I feel a great debt of gratitude to the Theosophical Society because it was Colonel Olcott who was responsible for training people, including, of course, Anagarika Dharmapala, and revitalizing these incredible traditions. So, you know, I I'm I'm really am enormously grateful for what Olcott did and promoting this ancient culture and bringing it back. And the fruit and the importance of meditation is really something. And to me, we just have to demystify it from the complexity of skillful means. I'm not criticizing skillful means. I'm all for people using the basic meditative skill of shamatha and vipassana to develop other psychic capacities. This is possible, but it's not fundamental to meditation. And unfortunately, what people do is they put the cart before the horse and they try and get those psychic capacities and those other things before they fully understood their own reactivity. And the result of that is what's called spiritual materialism. They try to grab the fruit before they have the means. And this is very unfortunate. And, you know, in many ways, I think my generation were responsible for spiritual materialism in the West because we were the ones who first got Buddhist influences coming at us from all sides. And our children look at us and go, you guys, you're just going after spiritual attainments like the generation before was going after money. There was nothing good about what you were doing. And I think they're correct. I think there's a corrective that needs to be introduced. And that is to explain what meditation is. So that basic skill can be separated from all of the other ornaments it carries. And when we do that, then we suddenly go, OK, so meditation is just something that should be along with reading and writing. As I said, it's not anything religious or anything at all. It doesn't affect people's religious positions. It is completely compatible with science. Indeed, scientific insight 
is now confirming what the meditators saw. There's the most remarkable convergence in which cognitive psychology is demonstrating that the medieval meditators were accurate in their self-observation. That is truly remarkable. For example, there are meditation manuals from the third century that point out that chitta, consciousness, flickers like this. Flick, 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 flick. We now know that's the case. That means those people accurately described a fundamental physiological function. And this is really quite something. And we can use modern scientific technique to show what we're meditating on. But there's something fundamental. And, you know, this is another point that's probably worth making. There's a wonderful philosopher called Thomas Nagel. And Nagel's one of these philosophers who writes in plain English. And he, he wrote an article in the 70s called What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Now, this is an amazing article. What it says is this. It says, let's gather all the bat physiologists, all the bat zoologists, all the bat anatomists, all the bat, you know, environmentalists, all the people who know about bats. And let's write an encyclopedia about bats. No matter how many books you write about bats, you are never going to know what it is to be a bat. What it is to be a bat is something only bats know. Now, in exactly the same way, you go into a bookshop, into the mind, body and spirit or whatever it's called now, you know, section. And there are books upon books written by neurophysiologists and neuroanatomists saying, what is it like to be happy? 101 ways to be happy written by some boffin who's got, who's got a degree in neurophysiology. This is an utter nonsense. The only way you're going to know what it is like to be you is to be you. There doesn't matter how many brain maps we have, how many machines we have that measure brain function, none of them are going to tell you what it is like to be you. But if you are a victim of reflexive reactivity, you will never find out what it's like to be you because the whole time you're being pulled around by a map. So another way of seeing this is saying, OK, I'm just going to stop the map making and be me. And I will vipassana me. I will suddenly see clearly what it's like to be me. And that is the recovery of our humanity. It is not incompatible with science. It is merely complementary. And indeed, you're a much better scientist if you know what it's like to be you and you're a much better user of technology if you know what it's like to be you so this is not in any way anti-science or anti-religion or anti-anything else it is the complement that completes our capacity and we live in a golden age of scientific discovery and technological development. It is quite literally the most productive period of human history. But at the same time, we are teetering on the edge of the apocalypse. We literally are because of this blindness about map making. If we can only see cognition and recognize what cognition is, and then see in that recognition that we're making a map, if we can just see that, then we can use the technology and the remarkable powers that our culture has developed for the good of all. And that is an instinctive reaction of human beings. Human beings are basically good. The problem is we're being led astray by this mechanical reflexive reactivity that is literally driving us over a cliff. And so to me, this is a really important, almost like an urgent requirement. And the simpler we can make it, the better. Three minutes a day is so simple. I hope that everybody will try. I'm so sad when I hear people say, oh, I tried meditation, but it didn't work for me. You think, oh, my gosh, what did you try? Because you can't have tried this because this will work for you. You know, it must have been something else you were trying. Um, and to me, that's very sad. And then other people say, oh, if you meditate, you must be a Buddhist. 
No, not at all. You can be anybody. It, it is nothing to do with religion. And so I just want to try to get it out there into the generality of our culture as a non-threatening life skill that's merely about what it is to be a human being. And that's it. Well, there are certainly many angles we could uh, take from uh, what you've said, all of which would be fascinating. But let's go back to the six gates, which are the the, the Tibetans posit five senses, just the, uh, the way the rest of us do. And they also posit thought as a sense. So everything, as I understand it, so everything is coming in through these six gates. Not now, the Tibetan, by the way. That's the fundamental teachings. The I call the Ayatana goes right back. The earliest okay, well, records we've got. And we'll talk about the six gates. One of the fundamental categories. Okay, Obviously. but but um, the minute you examine this, you start to realize how limited each of those gates is. Right. Do we you? know we can only see a tiny part of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. Are you sure? What? You're, you're well, making a lot of assumptions here. Believe that's me. a pretty basic scientific assumption. So I'm, uh, I'm uh, taking that so far. Well, that's the point. Well, is there a way of expanding or transcending the apparent limits of the six gates? Yeah. Okay. So I tell you, I, I agree. Of course, scientific materialism is going to tell you what you can and can't do. Those are all inferences. So, you know, scientists do experiments and they infer this and that. Fair enough. However, if you actually begin to engage with the cognition of the six gates rather than the recognition of the six gates, you find something rather remarkable. Your sensorium is really quite something. It is. And it's just that we don't we react to it rather than engage with it. So I'm not, I don't, I don't want to hear that we can and can't do this and that. What I want to do is say, let's engage and see. For example, the retina of the eye is so sensitive it can detect a single photon. Who knows what it might be capable of? And indeed, when you hang out with meditators, they can have quite remarkable capacities. And you think, where is it coming from? Now, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, you know, a great psychic master. But what I would say is. If, for example, you sit and you listen without reacting and just explore what's coming in through your ears, you hear things that normally you would ignore because they're not interested to, interesting to your reactive map. Suddenly your sensorium is growing. You know, I was very, very influenced by Krishnamurti because some of his dialogues or they always begin with him sitting and enjoying his sensorium, you know, beautiful morning and, you know, the birds are singing. And it's so beautiful the way he writes because he was engaging with his senses and just simply recording what was happening. Then he would give an interview. I, I was very influenced by the second Penguin Krishnamurti reader. I remember it so well. I used to read it every morning. I think, wow, this is so interesting. I didn't really understand what it was about, but now I think I do. He was engaging with his senses, and he wasn't judging, and he wasn't reacting. He was merely engaging. Now, you know, what is reality? What is reality? Reality is what we engage with. I don't care if a scientific guy tells me there are black holes. Of course, it's great. And maybe because of that knowledge, we'll get new technology. But it is an inference. It's an idea that comes from the guy's work and what he's inferred. It isn't real in the proper sense of that term. What is real is what is coming to me. And what is real is what is coming to you. There is no external reality because it cannot be experienced. And the idea that the real is beyond experience, by definition, is quite obviously incomprehensible. It would literally imply that we can't know anything because what is real is beyond our knowledge. That is the most extraordinary idea. And indeed, the person who wrote that down 
wouldn't be real either. So it is a self-contradictory position to take. Ultimately, what is real is what comes to us. The key is to be able to engage with it. And if we do and we respond to our senses, we find remarkable capacities. Now, of course, this is the function of art. A great artist like a Cezanne or a Rembrandt or Vermeer, even more amazing, will record exactly what's coming in and be able to put it down. And then when you look at these works of art, they just stop time. It's as if they oblige you to stop the clock. Suddenly there is this transcendent object that's merely recording. It is doing nothing more. But nonetheless, the effect of it is to stop time. And this to me is very, very interesting. There's a wonderful word, the word numinous. You get the numinous feeling out of a great work of art. And again, to me, that's very, very interesting because it's the call of the cuckoo saying, wake up, wake up. You guys are in a map. Wake up, wake up. Stop mapping. Come into the real world. Hello. And it's that little call. And I think that's really, really, really where a lot of our longing comes from. You know, so many of us long to have a more meaningful life. It's right in front of us. The meaningful life we're looking for is technically 400 milliseconds in front of our nose. Always. It's in that 400 milliseconds in which we make our map that we lose the world and get ourselves. And when we learn to get a little bit closer into our sensorium, suddenly there's a different world altogether. And that to me is such a magical discovery. And it's so simple to achieve. That's beautiful. I'm wondering what relation your teachings, both in this book and elsewhere, have to the uh, Dzogchen lineage in Tibetan Buddhism? Um, well, you know, people make a lot of noise about these terms like Dzogchen, etc. And they are very amazing. And it is true that Dharma College's curriculum comes from authentic sources because I have the great good fortune to be married to Wang Mo, who is the eldest daughter of Tartang Rimsho, who's one of the very few remaining fully trained Tibetan lamas. And the Tibetan meditation system, at least in part, does stress this little and often type of thing. So they're on that, and I can go back and say, yeah, it's in Zog, but actually it's in all the lineages, this idea. Um, it's, not, it's not an exclusive to one lineage. Because really, when you go back and read the very earliest teachings of the Buddha, he's always saying, see, see. He's trying to get people to see. And what I think is so crazy is we've always got Buddha sitting in meditation. That's our Buddha. Our Buddha statue is some guy sitting in meditation, right? But that isn't what the Buddha did. In fact, probably he, if he meditated at all, it was for minutes a day. He was continuously active, teaching the whole time. When he wasn't teaching, he was walking from one village to the next or going to arms. But where do we have statues of the Buddha brushing his teeth or the Buddha having lunch? <laughs> we don't have those ones. All we have is the Buddha meditating as if that's what the Buddha did. He did not. And indeed, he kept company with the most average of people. In fact, many of his students were courtesans a very old-fashioned word for prostitute, and business people, and then farmers. It was just normal folk. He wasn't in any way in some monastery, sitting for eight hours a day looking at a wall. That is absolutely not what the Buddha is recorded as having done. And to me, that's really interesting, because it does point to the fact that this is a fundamental insight that we can take anywhere. And yes, of course, it's got relations to the non-dual traditions, for very, very simple reasons, and I, I'm happy to go into those, but this isn't a particular system. That is the skillful means that comes from this basic skill. This is just a basic skill. But when I say basic skill, it's like saying, okay, this is a motor car. You can drive this anywhere. If you want to make a Ferrari, if you want to make a Formula One car, you can then take this motor car and evolve it into that. But you don't need a Formula One car to go shopping. 
this motor car is really 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 useful <laughs> you know so don't don't say oh it's just a just a useless thing not at all this is really the best thing you could possibly have and so to me shamatra and vipassana are the basic car that you can drive anywhere then if you want to make a tank okay you go in that direction that's great but you don't need a tank and you don't need a formula one car you just need this one and that to me is the point and that's in every one of the lineages and, and you know the asian meditation traditions are an unbroken lineage for at least two and a half thousand years that's an amazing thought there are no western lineages that are unbroken sadly they're all broken and so although if you were to go back to the medieval period, the high medieval of the 11th and 12th century, you would have found a very different world. We have no, almost no knowledge of it. It's so broken. Literally, it's so hard to get back into the mindset of what those people were like. I'll give you an example. There was a physicist writing for the king of France. He was called Nicolas Oresme. And this is in the 12th century, so 1120, 1130. And he wrote a book on mechanics. It was called On Movement. And it has three examples he analyzes in this book. The first one is the rolling of a ball down an inclined plane. Well, OK, that's mechanics. You roll a ball, you measure it, etc. The second one was the ripening of an apple. And the third one was the movement of grace in the heart. The movement of grace in the heart was in the same book on motion as the rolling of a ball down an inclined plane. Now, we can barely imagine the world that Nicholas Oresme was living in. There's no way a modern person, contemporarily educated, could write that book. Because we make a distinction between the, quote, external world and the, quote, internal world but that distinction is a metaphysical presupposition it is an inference and we have become blind to the inferential nature of knowledge and this is a tragedy we lost our wisdom lineages the whole modernity has lost connection with its wisdom lineages with the exception of the Asian meditation traditions, which are intact because of the amazing Vinaya, the monk's rule that kept them intact through the ages. And that is really why they're so important. And so again, realizing that is to realize something very interesting. You go, wow, this is really a cultural jewel that we've got here that we can use. And it does give something very valuable to contemporary conditions. It enables us to recover our humanity and not to do so by learning a bunch of rules about how to do the right thing and the wrong thing and all that stuff. Not at all. It's not rule based. So it doesn't suffer from the weakness of the liberal world order, which is so rule based. Now it's political correctness and you've got to be careful what you call people and all this sort of stuff. This is not the way. The way is to recover your humanity through recognizing and then resting prior to recognition in cognition itself and when that happens your humanity just blossoms and you're no longer the reactive difficult person you were before you suddenly find yourself being kind and friendly and open-hearted because that's what human beings are we don't have to be taught to be nice we actually are kind and the kindness that people aspire to, they already have. It's just it's being covered over by this paranoia that's coming from map making. And again, that's a great discovery to realize we're basically kind. Uh, you know, I read an amazing book called Humankind, written by a, a Dutch physiologist called Rutger. It's about the systematic falsification of psychological experiments made by, phys by, by physiologists to show that human beings are basically unkind. For example, and this is something I, I, I'll end on, the, uh, there was a bunch of kids who were, who were left on a desert island, and we were told that they turned into this terrifying Lord of the Flies world in which there were leaders and there were people being beaten up and all this stuff, where the Lord of the Flies idea came from. You know, it's totally false. Actually, these kids who were washed up on a desert island, when they were discovered, they had made a school for themselves, 
They had a completely egalitarian society. They were living perfectly okay. It is a complete fabrication, this idea that when humans aren't being controlled, they'll turn into savages. Absolutely the reverse. When we're not controlled, we turn into human beings, which turn out to be nice and kind and cooperative. It's really quite remarkable how we are being sold a dummy, a dud, by people who wish to control us, advertisers, whether they're political advertisers or whether they're economic advertisers. They're all out to get us. And the key is to learn how to recover our humanity in the face of this onslaught. That's meditation. That's what it's for. I can't resist asking you about your father-in-law, Tarthang Tulku, oh. who is uh, you know, certainly one of the most dynamic and creative uh, Tibetan lamas to come to the uh, West. Uh, he's also been among the most preclusive. Um, and so very few people have seen him for a very, very long time or interacted with him. As his son-in-law, uh, what are your impressions of him on a day-to-day -day personal basis? Well, Tate Rimshe is a phenomenon, that's for certain. Um, he dedicated, I mean, he, he used to teach, you know, actually, during the first period of his uh, career in America, from 68 to 76, he was teaching very actively. And then he was so appalled by the destruction of the monasteries and the destruction of Tibetan culture and the plight of the Tibetan refugees in India that he decided to dedicate his efforts to printing books and to read to give them back the libraries they'd lost. And so he has now personally edited over 3,000 Tibetan texts which are the basic syllabus that the monks learn. And he's been responsible for the printing and distribution of over 7 million copies. And so he has dedicated himself almost completely to doing this. And this was a necessity. I am sure in a happier age, he would have taught exclusively. But there was an emergency because this ancient culture, very literate, you know, the Buddhist commentarial literature is larger than all the world's religions combined. About 12 million original titles in the Buddhist commentarial literature. It's bigger than every other religion combined. It's like, oh my God, it's absolutely vast. And the Tibetan system is very much based on study, contemplation, practice. You must study, then you contemplate, then you practice. So it's very important for them to have these books. So you know, he felt this culture was literally going to die if he didn't do something. And he was there in America with the means because American, you know, American society is remarkably productive. And consequently, with a very small group, I mean, he's probably got 50 people who work with him closely. They printed 7 million books. I, mean, I was just like, wow, you know, people can't believe it. And that's what he dedicates his time to. But when you spend time with him, he's always saying to you, who is looking? Who is actually reacting here? He's always wanting to inquire if you are in cognition or recognition. He's interested in knowing what your state is. And the interesting thing about him as a lama, as a lama literally means lamb, path, ma, mother, path, mother, is he is not, he's pretty certain that merely translating Tibetan or Buddhist whatever, Buddhist traditions into English is going to cause problems because the technical language, which was developed for contemplation, it was developed for shamatha and vipassana, doesn't translate readily into Western languages because we need a special language to actually translate it. So he began to write books in plain English. And the main book that we teach at Dharma College is called Revelations of Mind. It is a 450-page book about cognition and recognition without a single Tibetan, Sanskrit, Pali, Buddhist word in it. Zero. Because he feels very strongly that we need to bring these ideas into our own culture and express them in our own way. So he's rather remarkable like that, although he's very traditional and his activity is toward his own culture. He's nonetheless written 37 books for a Western audience, a contemporarily educated audience, and they're all in plain English. They're not Buddhist books at all. 
And so he's really quite interesting like that. He's a truly magical being without question. Of course, I have the great good fortune to meet him sometimes. But he is so busy. He works 12-hour days. And he's 89, and he's still working 12-hour days. He is a nonstop producer. And, you know, he's one of those, you know, incredible phenomena that happens. He's a, a spiritual tyro who is single-handedly rebuilt the monastic uh, libraries right through India and the Himalayas. I mean, there isn't a Buddhist library you can go to in the heartland of Buddhism that doesn't contain many of the books he's printed. And my wife and I actually run a foundation called the Light of Buddha Dharma Foundation that funds the Theravada to come back to India. So he doesn't just fund Tibetan projects. He also funds Theravadan projects. And indeed, we now hold a prayer festival in Bogaya every year. It's now in its 19th year. It's the largest international gathering of the Theravadan school. And who is it funded by? Tartan Rinpoche. So, you know, he's really very broad-minded. He feels passionately that the teachings of the Buddha have a profound importance, particularly for modernity. And he's always saying in his books, guys, wake up. If we don't get this right, we could destroy ourselves. We really need to understand how we are coloring our world. The world we think is, quote, real is full of conditioning based in our unconscious past. And if we don't understand that, we're going to make big mistakes, even though we're wise, even though we've got all this technology, even though we are rational, but well, actually maybe we're not wise, even though we are rational, and we have all this technology, if we don't discover this basic wisdom, big and bad mistakes can happen. And, you know, you can have the United Nations and you can have political structures and all the rest of it. But if there isn't this basic wisdom, they will not stop the catastrophe. And so, you know, I'm not wanting to be doom and gloomy about this, because to me, it is such a simple skill. We don't need to worry about it. But nonetheless, it has this extraordinary benefit. And so I, my wish for humanity is please, in fourth grade, teach meditation. So the kids, when they grow up, aren't going, this is real. I'm pointing to something that's real. You know, as like, I've got to be rich or science is real or whatever it is. These ideas that they're taught, which are so misleading, they'll realize they're all inference. And their ultimate humanity is always with them. If only that would happen, the world would change. It would, that is the single most important thing that will change the world. Of course, I want to see no poverty. Of course, I want to stop nuclear proliferation, and blah, 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 all of this stuff. Of course. But fundamentally, the problem is about cognition and recognition. That is where it starts. And if we could fix that, everything else would follow. Is that's the basic root problem of humanity. And the idea that somehow politics will fix anything is really the message of Marcus Aurelius. You read Marcus Aurelius and you think, well, he couldn't fix it then and we can't fix it now. And he didn't have any technology and we have a whole bunch of technology. So it's clearly not technology that's going to fix anything. You know, we're going to get fusion energy, I'm sure. That isn't actually going to fix the fundamental problem. Unfortunately, good as fusion energy is going to be, we are still going to be stuck in this recognitive maze. And so there again, one lands up thinking, wow, this is fundamental. This is not some addition. This is fundamental to being a human being, being homo sapiens, to actually get to the sapiens bit and understand how to develop sapiens. And sapiens doesn't need training, it needs uncovering. Because when we cognize rather than recognize, we find our humanity and we find we can see clearly. And some things are obviously not worth doing. <laughs> you have to think too hard about it. You realize it just isn't worth doing. Even though our recognitive man oh, go for it, go for it, go for it, go for it. And look, guys, I don't know if that's such a good idea. And once we get to that, then suddenly a whole lot of things become possible. We become compassionate. 
you know, you look at people who are super rich and super successful, so stressed and so pulled this way and that by all the problems. You, you have to be compassionate and say, wow, was it really worth it? Or you look at political leaders who's truly aging them, killing them because of the circumstances they're in. You have to ask, why are we doing what we're doing? And these sorts of questions are only askable if we are meditators. Otherwise, we just go after the carrot, like the carrot in front of the donkey, trotting along down the road to ruin. And so to me, this is the one thing that's really worth saying. And although I was a scientist for many years and a businessman for many years and spent a long career doing all these sorts of things, at the end of the day, I deeply believe this is the most important thing I can do, persuade people to achieve shamatha and so vipassana who they are. And if we can do that, boy, we'll change the world. Well, that's great. That's uh, brilliant. You've given us a, a huge amount uh, to contemplate in the last hour. And I think we've come to the end of our time. So I think we will uh, stop here. I hope viewers will understand uh, um, the amount of depth and subtlety uh, that you've conveyed in the last hour. And we'll certainly take it to heart. But again, I thank you very much. It's been fascinating, delightful, and of course, educational. Thank you. My pleasure.